All right, this lecture is about another way that we look at probability that becomes even more interesting and useful to us, although slightly more complex as well. This is something that you really need to master. master. This is what the probability stuff is leading up to. You need to figure out how to use probability distributions to answer hypothesis testing and confidence interval and other problems like that. Uh, so I'll walk you through it, and hopefully you can get this even if you have to walk it, watch it a few times. So let's see here, switching slides, that's important. We've got this process that we've talked about already, this random process that we focus on that can have multiple outcomes. We've got all these multiple possible outcomes from this random process, right? And we're interested in a particular outcome and maybe we look at this actual outcome and we say, how likely was that? So we've got this process of uh, um, these random processes now, what happens if we multiply those? We have all sorts of random processes. Sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't happen the way we're interested in. How can we describe this? Because this is one of the next steps for probability, is a whole bunch of random processes. Uh, sometimes they happen the way we're interested in, sometimes they don't. And we want to describe the probabilities, like what's the probability of 12 of these happening this way, or three or fewer of these happening this way. And that's where probability distributions come in. So just to frame the question, let me show you a few um, specific uh, examples of how you might use a probability distribution or where you might need one. Let's say a single random process is a person's health status. And the outcome of interest from that process is that the person might have had a previous HPV infection, um, human papillomavirus, genital herpes. No, genital herpes, genital warts actually. So HPV. Well, there are about 74% of the population, from what I was reading on the CDC's website, who are estimated to have previously had an HPV infection. So that's a pretty high probability. But now we're interested in saying, what if we looked at the number of people in a class at UTPA and to see who has a previous infection of HPV? Okay, that's interesting. Now, what if I narrow this down and say, we have a randomly selected sample of 10 people from a particular class Oh, I said UTPA, didn't I? A particular class of people, uh, let's say Fredonia. Now, what is the probability that three or fewer of them would have a previous HPV infection? Now, why would we say three or fewer? Well, maybe we sampled 10 people from a class who volunteered for a study and were looking to research HPV or something. And we only found that in the bloodstream of three of those, you have evidence of a previous infection. Well, that would be interesting. What's the likelihood of that happening? So what's the likelihood of that, that result happening for us? Here's another, another uh, example. Let's think of the single random process of one person's driving activity. And we could look at a lot of things, but let's say the outcome that we're interested in is, are they texting at any given point? And let's say that at any given point, for some reason, we have data saying 10% of drivers are texting. I couldn't find quickly any data on this, so I chose a number. It's actually pretty high. I, I suspect it's much, much lower than this, but well, let's go with this for now. So. If we're looking at multiple outcomes, instead of saying what's the probability, probability that one driver is texting, we ask ourselves what's the probability that there are a lot of people? How many, how many people are driving? What's the probability that there are X number of people texting? Let's say I randomly observe people from my secret telescope research place on the side of the highway by that big blue Fredonia sign, and I randomly sample 20 drivers. What's the probability that, say, three or more of them might be texting? That might be an interesting question for us. So another single process might be cheating by means of copying an exam in college. And one out might be that at least once in college, a person has copied an exam. So if you ask people, either they say yes or no, uh, if you can ensure them confidentiality or anonymity, that they say yes or no, they have copied an, an exam. And actually the national data, some of them suggest that the, the number of copying an exam is about this high, about 50% in college students. So a multiple event perspective, we would say how many students have cheated at least once? Let's say we get a random sample of 25 students and we ask them, and uh, only eight of them say that they've ever cheated. Well, maybe we're questioning whether people are really responding to our survey honestly. Maybe we haven't ensured them anonymity and confidentiality enough, and maybe this number is a little low for us. So we could say, you know, what's the probability that eight or few people or fewer people in a random sample of, of um, 25 students would truly have ever copied an exam? And if that probability is pretty low, then we might say, well, 
maybe we need to beef up the, the protections for anonymity and confidentiality in our research. So here's another one. Getting back to simplistic stuff. A single random process is one toss of a coin. The outcome of interest might be heads. So 50% probability on any toss of the coin, right? The individual, uh, looking at it from multiple outcomes, how many heads would we expect in three consecutive tosses of a coin? And we might ask, what's the probability of observing two or more heads in three coin tosses? So let's work this one out. And this is where we're gonna dive into probability distributions. This particular type of distribution is called a binomial, meaning two numbers. So let's list all the possibilities on eight tosses, or sorry, on, on three tosses of a coin. It turns out there are eight things that can happen on three tosses of a coin. Now in the columns, I've got the three tosses, toss one, toss two, toss three. And I'm gonna list all the unique possibilities. There are eight of them. So for instance, one of the possibilities is that you could get heads, heads, and heads, right? Or you could say coin one, coin two, coin three, same idea. You could get all of them heads. Since there are eight things that could happen, the number of heads is three, and the probability of that particular thing happening is one eighth, which is 0.125. So one in eight probability that you'll get all three heads. So we can look at all these possibilities. So you can see the next one is you could get heads, heads, tails. Now that's the same number of heads and tails as say tails, heads, heads, or heads, tails, heads. So two, three, and four, they all have the same number of heads, but they have it in different ways. And for this kind of uh, an analysis, you have to take into account all the different ways things can happen, even if you can summarize them similarly. So you can count for each outcome, for each specific thing that could happen, you can count something uh, simple about it. We're not interested in the whole pattern of outcomes. We're just interested in the number of heads for each outcome. Now for each of those, for each individual outcome, the probability is gonna be one in eight because it's purely random. They're all independent of each other. And each of them has the same probability of happening. Since there's eight things, it's one in eight. So 0.125 for each of them. So the next step we can do, we're not at the distribution yet. Now we've just listed possibilities, but now the distribution, we group uh, the number of heads together, similar numbers of heads. So we make a grouped frequency table of the number of heads per possibility. You can see up there that some of these things have zero heads, some have one head, some have two heads, and some have three heads. This conversation could be about mythical animals, I suppose, but it's about coin tosses. So for three heads, there's only one way that can happen. So there's only one possible outcome with three heads. The proportion of those outcomes is 0.125, so one eighth. So the probability of getting three heads is one eighth. For two heads, there are more possibilities. There are three ways you can get two heads, which means one tail because there's only three coin tosses. There are three ways that can happen. And so when you add up there three individual one eighth, one eighth, and one eighth, you have three eighths, which is 0.375. There are also three ways you can get one head. You can get heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, or tails, tails, heads. There are three ways to get one head on three tosses of a coin. And if you add up all those three individual probabilities, the probabilities of each of those three outcomes, so heads, tails, tails is one eighth, tails, heads, tails is one eighth, tails, tails, heads is one eighth, then you get, again, three eighths probability that this that you'll get one head on three tosses of a coin. So this is if you're just counting heads, not paying attention to the specific pattern. And often we do this effectively, and I'll show you in a minute. Zero heads, we have to keep in mind that that's one of the possibilities. Maybe we would get no heads whatsoever. There's one way that can happen. And just like three heads, it has a probability of one eighth, 0.125. So there you go. There's the, right over here, this is the probability distribution of tossing a coin three times where each success or each, each individual um, trial has a probability of 0.5 of what we call a success. In other words, just an outcome of interest. It doesn't have to be a happy thing, as I'll show you. So these are the probabilities. This is the distribution, and this is the number of successes and the probabilities of each of those numbers of successes. We can use these to answer a number of problems. Another way to look at this, um, just look at the probability distribution in... in uh, in, in table form for something a little bigger here. So let's say that the number of trials is eight. So it's as if we tossed a coin eight times. 
and the probability of a success or the thing we're interested in on each trial is 0.5. Now you have to choose whether it's head or tails you're interested in or this or that. Sometimes it's not coins, uh, but we call that a success. We, you pick one of them and you say that's a quote unquote success. So eight trials. So these are the theoretical probabilities. So I listed both successes and failures, but you only need to list successes because that tells you about the failures. If there were zero successes, you know there were eight failures. In other words, zero heads means eight fails. Now, it doesn't mean that this was really successful. Just keep that in mind. So the number of zero heads, you can that can only happen one way. And the probability, there are 256 individual things that can happen. I didn't list them all here. So this is just the distribution. This is just the probability distribution. This is the, just the group frequency table. So the number of ways that zero heads can happen is one, and one out of 256. There's less than a 4%, well, less than a half percent. 0.4% probability. So, and on up like this, you can see the probabilities get bigger and bigger until having four heads and four tails. There's just a lot of ways that can happen on eight coin tosses. There are 70 total ways that can happen, and over 25% probability, 27.3% probability that would happen. So, you can look in here and see what's the probability of any individual combination of numbers of heads and numbers of tails. But you won't see the specific pattern of how those happen because as you can see there are 256 specific patterns we're not interested in that sometimes we just want to know the number of heads and sometimes we graph it like this somebody put a pretty little curve over this graphic that i stole shamelessly from a textbook one time and so instead of looking at the probabilities in a table sometimes we look at them in a histogram like this i find it useful to do the histogram but usually on the tails there's a probability that it's so small that it doesn't show up at all so these distributions help us answer complicated questions. We have to specify the number, the probability of getting a success on each trial, the number of trials that we're going to do, and then we can get the whole thing going. So let's look here. Um, a single random process is a person's health status, HPV infection, 0.74 probability that any given person will have um, HPV in their history. Now this is like tossing a coin that's unbalanced and that has a probability of coming up heads 74% of the time, right? So we're gonna toss this coin 10, 10 times. So tossing the coin 10 times, what's the probability that it will come up tails three of those times or fewer? What's the probability that three or fewer people would have a previous HPV infection if the probability of any given person is 0.74? And if you're looking at a total group of 10 people that you sample, if this was purely random. Well, here it is, right here. Here's the probability. This is the distribution of all possibilities here. We can go from zero people having a previous HPV infection up to 10. And the probability of three or fewer of them is the height of these teeny, teeny bars. And as we can see, that's 0.4%. So less than one half of one percent. So if you so keep in mind what we're doing here, we've we've layered things on top of each other. These events have become very complex now. It's not the probability of one person having HPV in their history. It's not the probability of this number of people. It's the probability of three or fewer, three or two or one or zero people in a group of ten people having uh, a history of HPV or having no history of HPV. That's that probability, less than zero, less than a half a percent, so zero point four percent. So, one of our other examples here: a person's driving activity, they're texting, and we made this weird assumption that texting probability is ten percent. Any given person at any given time has a ten percent chance of texting, which is probably way too high. I don't think people are quite that stupid. Anyway, how many people are driving are texting? Let's say we randomly observed twenty drivers, and we saw three of them. Texting. Well, what's the probability that we would randomly select three or more drivers who were texting? So how likely is that? Maybe you saw three people texting out of 20, and you say, how likely is it that that should happen? Maybe Fredonia drivers text more, or the people who drive through, or something. Well, here you go. Here's the distribution. Here's the probability distribution, a graphic arrangement of probability distributions of observing different numbers of people texting. So success is they are texting. But like I said, success doesn't have to be a good thing. What's the probability of observing three or more? Well, here we go. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. These are so small you can't even see them. They're very, very small probabilities. So the probability is 
So this is like the probability of tossing an unbalanced coin that has a 10% chance of coming up heads, tossing it 20 times. What are the probabilities of getting three heads or more? Well, it only has a 10% chance of coming up heads, so it's not a big probability. So about a third. So maybe you would say, okay, I just got a weird sample. Here's this another example, cheating, copy an exam, the probability of any given student, let's assume it's 0.5. Um, and let's say out of our random sample of 25 students, only eight told us that they had previously cheated, well, well by this method, by copying an exam. Well, do we believe them? Do we think that maybe they didn't trust that our survey was truly anonymous or something? Well, let's find out what are the probabilities. If there's truly a 50-50 probability, you get this nice balanced distribution right here. And so the probability of eight or fewer is 0.05. Now this probability is much smaller than the probability of one person, right? It's the probability of a coin coming up tails eight times in a row, or eight times, not in a row, coming up tails eight times out of 25 tosses of the coin. So 25 students, what are the probability, what's the probability of the coin coming up tails eight or fewer times, or I guess eight tails eight or more, or heads eight or fewer times out of 25 tosses, and that probability is around 5%.